Cool. So you have a great title. I won't ask about the title, but can you please share us what your all-time favorite game is? Um, I've been very open about it. It's been Final Fantasy VII for the last 20 years. <laughs> uh, it's, it gave me the will to work in games. It created so much thought in myself um, for the past 20 years. Even today, I'm discovering new details that make me rethink the world. Like it's, it's been fundamental to my progression as a person. Wow, that's great to hear. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And enjoy the presentation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so ju just a warning, this, these slides I will put uh, for free online afterwards with creative comments so that everyone can give that talk afterwards. Uh, it's mostly funda fundamentals from um, game prototyping and philosophy that I wanted to share as a refresher for veterans and as, a, as insights for m more junior people in the industry. Uh, but first, a bit about myself. Um, I'm Inari. Uh, I'm, a, I'm actually well, currently, a uh, senior narrative designer at Next Games in this beautiful and sunny city that is Helsinki. Um, I've been working in the industry for the past uh, eight, eight to ten years, and before that I was in tabletop RPG. Uh, I've been working with a, a lot of different things, uh, ranging from tabletop to board games with AIs, uh, game TV shows, and mobile and triple to quadru quadruple A. Um, this year, I'm releasing two small self-published games, uh, uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage and uh, The Crew Motofest, uh, both with um, Ubisoft. Uh, so let's get the hype going. Um, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, this is mostly about fundamentals and thing that's, uh, things that most of you probably already know. This is not a commentary on your skills. I just want this industry to get better because from what I gathered um, talking with developers and working with hundreds of different people is that we're still having troubles uh, developing prototypes and games in general. Uh, so yeah, just a series of refreshers and things that we can discuss together later on. Um, one of them is processes are something that help you focus on what matters in general. It might be people, it might be your product. Um, it's been over overlooked uh, by a, a good part of the industry for quite a bit. Uh, at some point in, the, in, in our history, game design and game producing were sort of the same people doing things like saying, oh, we should do this, we should do this. And this created uh, a series of biases that pervade uh, to this day. Um, so overall, the, the origin for that talk is we have a prototyping issue or we have series of prototyping issues, and I wanted to address those um, so that we can get better collectively uh, and give back to the community the way Supercell wants us to, to do there. Also, uh, to warm up for, for John, uh, which will be there in 25 minutes for you guys. Um, so if we look a bit into the most common problems that I've observed uh, working mostly at Ubisoft, but also when uh, I was a freelancer before that, the first one is single loop learning, which means that uh, the way we make games, we learn how to make better games, uh, we learn new techniques, we learn how to collaborate with each other. There's a lot of things that we can unpack by working together, but we're not stopping enough to make time to learn how to build better processes to go faster or better on the longer run. Uh, second part is multi-rolling. I don't mean multitasking, or it's not a bad thing to have someone that is doing two jobs at the same time. What I think uh, can work uh, in a very prototype and garage way is having people multi-typing, uh, multi-rolling, sorry. <laughs> uh, but the, um, going forward, we should try and avoid recruiting people for this. It's, it's okay to be or to have unicorns. It's not okay to hunt for them. Uh, so by all means, protect your unicorns, but don't, make sh don't try and hire the, someone specifically for this. I've seen a lot of game, offers, uh, game designers job offers that display that they should be fluent in C++ or C Sharp or be a master at programming. Uh, this is a different role. 
And to me, this becomes a red flag uh, because that means you don't value design as much as you should. Um, doesn't mean that a, a game designer should never know how to program. This is a very useful skill. Um, just be mindful about recruitment as, uh, requirements. And the third one is development philosophies. Uh, where when we, when we start companies, we tend to make prototypes that are very uh, free form. There's no solid structure to help us, especially when we're smaller companies. And we tend to stick to that uh, philosophies of designing prototypes. Like we go forward, we say, okay, we have this amount of time, let's do something that we can be proud of in the end. Which is not a bad thing uh, when you're a small company, uh, but as you get bigger, this creates lo more and more problems. And this is part of what I want to address today. So when you're freeform prototyping, you have your people that are trying to make your product, your, your prototype, and the proof that what you want to do is worthwhile, but at the same time, you're putting them in the position that where they have to design the processes to get there at the same time. So by, uh, by essence, you're forcing them to do two jobs, the one of a planner and the one of their craft, which can create a lot of dangerous issues. Um, and that had been working in the 80s and the 90s, but the, the, 20, uh, the 20 hundreds were years where we started to put rationality into our processes, and we have to move forward from it. Um, overall, I think our industry, uh, to this day, is suffering from survival bias. We tend to look at the games that succeeded despite having bad processes, um, like so many AAAs, <laughs> so no, no, no shame intended. Um, and instead of trying to find better ways to make games which will be faster in the long run, we tend to reproduce the same patterns, uh, especially it's not a problem from the industry itself, it might be the way we teach game design and game development as a whole, because usually the teachers are ones that have been through the industry, have lived through, uh, through those processes, and we tend to enforce them onto students, which might be not the best thing to do, because we create this uh, circle of um, unending suffering in production. And yeah, as I was saying, um, what worked for 10 people, uh, garage, flexibility, not making any documentation, might work with 10 people because you know everyone can know the information they're supposed to know. Uh, but when you're 500 or have been working with up to 1,500 people team, it doesn't work not to have processes, documentations that is up to date, um, and it can create a lot of issues uh, that are very fundamental. Um, to our crafts. Um, I want to make a short break on to what Finland and Scandinavia brings us also as downsides and upper sides. Um, flatter hierarchies are amazing. They allow for quick collaboration, they allow for creativity and emulsion, emulsion uh, between people. And it allows also to focus on what everyone wants and try and find compromises and something that everyone can be proud of. Uh, but it can delay de decision making. And in an industry where making games is so expensive, um, it's dangerous. And we should still keep that part of our DNA as, a, as an industry, uh, but we have to be very careful of how we implement it, especially if we don't put the guidelines to protect the people from themselves on the longer run. Those processes are allowing us to focus on the people, uh, as said earlier, uh, but also to make sure what we deliver in the end is, wor is worthwhile. So the, proper, the first lesson I want to discuss today is no one can, be, can properly be the judge, jury, and executioner uh, in video games. But like if you have someone that is deciding, okay, here's what we, we are going to do with the prototype, here is what we're going to do with the prototype, and here is the learnings. If you put all those into the hands of the same person, uh, it can create very easy complacence, uh, well, complacency, sorry for the uh, approximate English. Um, it cr like we tend to repeat the patterns and that's how we ended up in that position where th things that were badly done 20 years ago are still done today. So I just want to have a look at what 
a, a simple process could be for a prototype, which is this. Uh, you have a director or a stakeholder in general that is providing you with a mandate. Uh, the mandate can be like a one pager saying, here's the intent, here's the expected deliverable, and a few things that you know you're working towards. From this, you can, ex uh, you can take a question, and that question should drive your prototype. Prototype can be anything. It doesn't have to be in Unity. It can be a Figma prototype. It can be, uh, I, I use a lot of tabletop RPGs as prototypes to know what a player, what's the player's first th th uh, thought when they are confronted with a specific situation. And yeah, you do your iterative process, process, um, and you go towards the gate. And once the gate is reached, your people are playing the game, and then you're trying to get an answer. Did the question that was the question asked answered at that moment in the game? If it's, the, the answer should be yes or no. If it, but just, if it, uh, just because it's a yes doesn't mean that you should move forward, and just because it's a no doesn't mean that you have to stop either. Uh, there's a lot of nuance that can be brought there. You can be a yes but, a no hand. There, there, there's a lot of things, but what matters is that you keep iterating on that question until you reach a, a conclusion that is relevant to the mandate that was given to you. If we get a bit more uh, on the iteration process, yeah, you get the question, a list of ideas that you funnel into one or more prototypes, then you go to the gate, you have the answer, and you iterate again and again. Sometimes the question might change because perhaps the question is the wrong one for the mandate that was given to you. Uh, but sometimes it's just you're not going the right way. Um, a, a, a thing that is fairly common in development industries uh, is the, the, the realization that when we started becoming agile in the 2000s, we actually went into high-speed uh, waterfall processes which burn people out uh, rather than saying, okay, we should iterate. There might be different opinions. We might get rid of stuff. Like It's very important to kill your babies. Uh, we will never say that uh, enough. So yeah, be open to getting rid of something and get rid of the um, loss aversion bias, which is one of the trickiest thing that you'll have to navigate in your career, in my opinion. Uh, so the, the title of this conference is a bit vulgar because I want this to be a very um, relaxed conversation. I'm not criticizing you as people. Uh, I'm part of the same industry. I've made the same mistake. I'm still making some of them. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, get us get better faster. Um, I wanted to be as communal as possible with this. So if you have any questions afterward, feel free to, to reach out. Uh, right now, we're getting into the meat. Um, the few lessons that I picked among the, the 20 or so that I had in mind for that talk. First one, and it's a mantra that has been repeated for the last 20 years, is fail faster. Um, if you've never heard of it, well, it, it's unlikely, but the goal is put things out fast. You can fix them later. Uh, but the, there's only one true way of failing, and it's by not learning. So if you fail faster, you learn faster. And if you learn faster, you can learn better. Uh, doesn't mean that you will do it. Uh, but one thing I've seen, especially in Ubisoft, is that we tend to make a lot of postmortems, but we never really learn from them. We make them, we don't present them to whole teams, it, or if we do, it might not be the right moment. Uh, so I think uh, postmortems should be on a more regular basis to share learnings between companies and, um, and, and teams in companies. Perhaps having one postmortem per phase of the game, like, oh, we went out of pre-production, pre sorry. Um, let's show people what we did, which mistakes we made, so that those don't reproduce at the same time in another project in the same team. Second, uh, and uh, I'm speaking about experience at the moment because I'm experiencing that discomfort. Um, embrace not being comfortable in what you're doing. Learn new things. Uh, try processes that you've n you're not familiar with. There's a lot of, of things that are offered on the internet or uh, even in that room you can ask 20 people. They will have 20 different processes to teach you. 
um, 20 good ideas that you might use at some point in your career, and you should be very, uh, we should be grateful that we have such an amount of knowledge in the same room um, to this day. Embracing this discomfort also means put yourself out there, ask questions that are tough, that might challenge the vision, that might challenge yourself as a person. Um, there is no easy way out of prototyping, especially if you want to innovate. Um, I think a lot of our projects, espe especially in the mobile side, need to have something more. And if we get complacent, we'll never get, get out there. We'll never have our um, clash of clans moments. We'll never have those. Uh, so we really need to embrace this kind of challenges on a daily basis, rather than sticking it, sticking to our habits uh, on the longer run. The next one, um, yeah, this should be obvious, uh, but I've seen a lot of teams focusing on details uh, at the wrong moment in their production cycle. Uh, prototypes are meant to be functional. The uglier, the better. It doesn't mean that you'd, you should not make mock-ups or prepare your art for the longer run, uh, but the closer you get to final uh, production value, the worse it gets to estimate if it's functioning at a deep level. Um, that's a personal opinion, sort of, but um, what matters is that things are testable. If you can't test, it doesn't matter how pretty it looks. So focusing on function is the main thing that we should just lean in when doing prototypes. Yeah, we'll improve on quality on the longer run, uh, but if you have to spend three years uh, building a prototype, well, maybe there's a problem uh, that is bigger than yourself uh, that needs fixing. Vertical slices, on the other hand, just come right after and they get to be pretty. Uh, they're proof that you are able to deliver what you're promising to your mandate giver and to the rest of the industry and the community together. Another lesson that should be fairly simple, uh, but it, that is often overlooked, um, is don't start by the beginning of your game. Um, my, my advice there is to prototype something in the middle. Because if you, t if you try and prototype what's early on, you will be uh, uh, hindered by your FTUE, uh, and you will make decisions based on it that might affect the, 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 your game in the longer run. That doesn't mean that it's a bad idea to prototype your FTUE in itself, but this is a specific mandate that should not be the first one that you undergo. You need to figure out your core gameplay before you need to figure out how your players will approach it. It's very interesting, though, to think them both together, uh, but if you start by designing your FTUE, your golden hour, what, whatever you call it, you will focus on details that will, that will prevent you from seeing the bigger picture. And finally, not every feedback is good feedback. Um, uh, whenever you get some feedback by your players, by the person giving you the mandate, by your coworkers, r think about how does did this feedback give me information that will help me answer the mandate in a better way than it does at the moment. Um, we're gonna, going to get a lot of feedback once the game is, op is out in the open, but we need to prototype early on so that we can just have raw data to exploit and make sure our mandate is satisfied, well, uh, completed at least, uh, when we finish this. And I've been a bit faster than I expected, um, so that might be more time for Q&A, but yeah, thank you.